Okay, so today on the Modern Musicking Show, we have a fantastic lineup. We're going to uh, hear about uh, Koji Kondo in the Music History Moment. We're gonna sit down with Steven Schultz. We're gonna have a really cool performance um, from uh, Alexa Woloshin's Music Since 1945 class. There's two pieces, one of them, uh, both pieces were written by students in the class. Stu two, both pieces were, both, piece, both pieces were written by students in the class. One features the zipper and the other features the blackboard. And then I get another lesson and I think you're going to really enjoy it. And let's don't fall into the bushes. Today on Jacob Random Holmes featuring Jacob Randall Holmes. Jacob, would you please pay me, play me a piece that's not really purple, but kind of off purple. Hi, I'm Lance LaDuc. We're at the Carnegie Mellon School of Music in the Vlahakis Recording Studio. I have another interview today. This is very, very, uh, uh, I'm very excited to interview Stephen Schultz. Stephen does a variety of things here at Carnegie Mellon, as do many of us. One of the more probably high profile things is he's the uh, conductor of music uh, director for the Baroque Ensemble. But why don't you explain, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for talking. Uh, and can you explain all of the things that you do here? I'm not sure I can, but I'll try. Um, I'm the director of the Baroque Ensemble which is an ensemble of modern instruments trying to perform 18th century music with historically accurate performance practice, which is a mouthful. So basically, we're playing a repertoire from the 18th century, uh -huh. not on original instruments, but for example, the string players use a Baroque bows, which helped. And um, I'm trying to instill in them a feeling of what the music was like in the 18th century, how it was actually performed, how it was thought of, because a lot of the times when we're playing 18th century music, uh, we're looking in our rearview mirror from the 21st century back, mm -hmm. and that which includes all the performance styles from the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. So I'm trying to instill in them how composers were thinking that direction forward from the 18th century. So they're basic principles that are a little bit different than how we normally interpret Tchaikovsky or Berlioz. What are some of the main uh, differences or what, what are the big surprises to the students? I would uh, say? Well, the first thing I say to them is stop vibrating. <laughs> 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 because uh, constant vibrato, either in uh, an instrument or a voice, is really a 20th century invention. I see. Uh, vibrato was always used as a beautiful ornament to the sound. But nowadays, unfortunately, we use vibrato to cover up a, a lot of sins right, and intonation. Sin. Sure. And there's a sort of a constant speed for vibrato. Mm -hmm. So I, that's the first thing we talk about. Let's try to make a beautiful sound without the use of vibrato. Then let's add to it. Um, also, not playing every single note exactly the same. That's something we tend to do, too. We see every note on the page, and it's all beautiful, and mm -hmm. it's all great, and we all want to make it sound the same. Right. But in the 18th century, music was thought of as conversation. Oh. So there's some stress and there's unstress. And so I try to get that. It's called good and bad beats. So not, not play every note exactly equal. Gotcha. Is it a, is it a tough adjustment for the students? Um, they, I think they find it amusing. <laughs> 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 uh, no, it's not tough because I say don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's too tough. I mean, by by the third or fourth week of the semester, they they sound great. The rules, they sure. sound really good. How large is the ensemble? It varies depending on the repertoire we pick. It's usually between fifteen and twenty-five players. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, sometimes we have singers, sometimes we don't, but it's mostly instrumental group. And what, what sort of instrumentation or what are the kind of it's general... It's usually a guys? core of string players, mm -hmm. about uh, 12 string players, and then we add usually a couple of flutes, a couple of oboes, sometimes they're trumpets, um, again, sometimes they're bassoons. And this is by audition? No. So it's, how do you the find only, your It's players? the only voluntary ensemble ah. at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> So basically, I mean, I, I know a lot of the people by just teaching here. So mm -hmm. um, if I don't know them, I ask them to play for me. But I don't, I don't think I've ever rejected anybody from Baroque Ensemble in uh, 15 years I've been here. And how often do you perform? Uh, we perform twice a semester. We usually do a convocation and then we do a concert the following weekend. I see. And uh, uh, how far in advance are you planning the programs? About a week. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Usually a semester. Yeah. I mean, my, my teaching and concert schedule myself is pretty busy, so I have to make sure I can book it about a year in advance what date so I'm actually here and able to do it. Why, why Baroque music? Why, why, were you attra why are you continually attracted to this music? Um, I was a modern flute player. I studied modern flute. Uh, and the repertoire that always appealed to me the most was the 18th century. I like the counterpoint. I like the... Articulation. I like the conversation ability of the of the you know flute and harpsichord or flute and orchestra. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time I heard a Baroque flute, 18th century wooden flute, was on an LP, and I just fell in love with the wooden sound. Hmm. And I decided, yeah, that's the instrument I want to play. And it took me a few years to transition off the metal flute, but it's it's a lot different feeling uh, touching wood. Mm -hmm. and blowing into a piece of wood than uh, metal. Mm -hmm. I love modern flute. It's played well, but it's not really my thing. You play Baroque music, but on contemporary instruments. Is that a controversial... Instrumentalists at CMU are all modern instrumentalists. I There's see. not really a Baroque program here. There's some places in the country where you can go study and learn how to play Baroque flute and harpsichord and Baroque violin. Mm -hmm. But this is really a modern instrument school. The kids are coming here to learn how to get into orchestras, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I, I would say it's not controversial to play 18th century music on modern instruments. It's just the way we're doing it is a little bit uh, different. I see. And hopefully it works. I see. Yeah. And uh, how, how, do you, how do the students respond to this music? Do you see surprise? I mean, I, I think they're used to doing a certain thing. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Mm -hmm. They're used to thinking of this music in a certain way. They're used to playing it in a certain way. And you're... you're um, uh, showing them a, a very different um, perspective yeah. on it. I think they're used to thinking a little bit like uh, not not typewriter music, but kind of very not very interesting. Kind of square. You know, maybe yeah. counterpoint is nice, but I try to show them that, as I mentioned before, it's conversation. The instruments are really talking to each other, and there's a really give and take. And once they understand a little more about how it's put together, the harmonies and, and the counterpoint, I think it becomes more interesting to them. And I always try to pick. <clears throat> well-known pieces for Baroque Ensemble. We're doing Brandenburg concertos this time, but also some gems that they won't know mm -hmm. because I barely discovered them myself <laughs> uh, to, to turn them on to some beautiful music that's not played very often. So how do you find uh, new pieces? New, well, uh, new ha old pieces? half of my life besides teaching is performing. Uh -huh. um, I travel around a lot and perform at different orchestras and chamber groups, and I'm, I'm always learning about new music as well. The 18th century repertoire is vast. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you go to a major library, all the complete works of Handel take shelves and shelves, and Bach takes even more shelves. Mm -hmm. But for example, Telemann, they haven't even found all the pieces that Telemann's written. Oh, my. So people are constantly discovering new orchestral suites in basements of libraries or in attics of people's homes. And so it's, it's a constant discovery, which right. is great. All right. Well, this has been a real delight. It's been very, yeah, very nice getting to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. So... Once again, from the Vlahakis Recording Studio at the School of Music at Carnegie Mellon University, I'm Lance LaDuke. Thanks for watching. All right, today, Hiroki, you also is going to show me a little bit about the cleaning and maintenance of the bass and the bow. I will start with uh, cleaning the bass with uh, a rag. Here's a rag. It's a bright orange one. So you just have to uh, just brush against the, uh, the strings. There's always going to be like rosin sometimes caked on it, so I just want to firmly get rid of the I see. Uh, rosin dust. Like on your base right now, there's uh, white powders on it. Yes, those are just rosin. And if, oh, you, wow, let it, yeah. if you don't clean it uh, frequently, then those will stick forever and will cause problems so that you cannot produce sound. That's not so good. So then how often are you doing this? You will probably want to do this every day. Or after, you after you play every day, every time. 
So if you're in a concert, would you be doing this at an intermission as well? Or are you just sort of, based on how it looks, you just kind of wait and you just sort of know. Yeah, yeah you kind of know. If you were playing like aggressively with lots of rosin, then you want to. Boy, it's a lot of... harder to uh, get that off than I would have guessed. Yeah. Cool. All right. Sorry, great. I destroyed your Oh, no. You're totally great. And then the other thing is this brush. So you want to, after you're done with uh, practicing the base, uh -huh. uh, you want to remove any of the uh, rosin off of the excess rosin off of the uh, bow because they will clump up and become like dusty, I guess. And so. then it'll translate into the like it'll make the it'll disturb the pitches, I, I assume. Yeah, well, like the you don't want them to. Uh, oh yeah, it, do, it will become murkier, I guess it would be. Yeah, because you can't produce a more beautiful sound because the dust is in the way. So all you have to do is just kind of. Yeah, that's a clump. <laughs> So you just want to go through the bow hair. And so it becomes nice and flowy. Yeah. Oh wow. I just removed all the clumps. And wow. The first one was kind of oh, it's clumpy too. Well all in like one motion. Wow. Never like back and forth because So always from the frog out. Oh yeah, that's always easier, so okay. why don't you give it a go? We'll give it a shot. Well it's beautiful sounding as well. Yes. It's actually better than my bass playing. Oh, it's pretty good. Yeah, you, yeah, you can, no. no. It's a joke, <laughs> no. come on. You're not laughing at these, I'm doomed. Oh, no. Okay, good. Well, that's part of the bass cleaning. And then if you wanted to, like, there are always uh, rosin dust that comes, kind of falls onto the bass as well. Oh, So, like, just, sure. just every once in a while. This doesn't have to be, like, every day or anything, but just kind of clean the as whole you body of it. And the fingerboard, I'm too. a mess over here. Hold on. No Windex? No Windex. Just oh, no. Just kidding. And the bridge too, if you're like, feeling adventurous. I don't feel that adventurous, so I'm going to leave my bridge the way it is. Okay, so that will be the general gist of maintenance of the base. That's not too bad. Yeah. That's how you maintain your base. It's time for another music history moment. Hi, Koji Kondo is a Japanese composer for the video game company, Nintendo. Hired in 1984, Kondo was the first composer to specialize in music composition for Nintendo. He is a pioneer of video game music, known for his role in composing the soundtracks of Legend of Zelda, as well as Super Mario Brothers. Other games Kondo created the soundtrack for include Star Fox, Mario Party, The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, and many other Nintendo video games. Next time you play a Nintendo game, Listen for the music of Koji Kondo. And that was a music history moment.
<laughs> how am I? How am I doing? This, this is, is fantastic. This is great. <laughs> I think he was waving. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to ask you the last one. <laughs> <laughs> was it wonderful? I think it was funny. If it was funny, that's good enough. <laughs> Let's edit that one out. <laughs> Maybe well, erase that. <laughs> <laughs> that progression they made from she loves you to that, and he's waving here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enough about the Beatles. Talk yeah, to uh, me. no, it's fine. <laughs>Hey, thanks for watching the show. If you want to reach us with questions or comments, you can figure out all the ways to do that by clicking on any of those links in wherever you're watching this thing. We've had a great time putting these together and hope you find them useful as well. Thanks for watching.